Now, let's talk about cerebral perfusion pressure, or CPP. The normal intracranial pressure values are going to be 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And the normal mean arterial pressure, as we all know, is about 70 to 105 millimeters of mercury. Generally, 70 is going to be that number that they're going to be referencing for the CCRN exam. You want to try to keep the mean arterial pressure around that value. Now, the normal cerebral perfusion pressure, or CPP as we know it, is going to be between 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So that's a very, very important value to understand and to comprehend. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further. So when we look at cerebral perfusion pressure as a value, how you derive that value is going to involve the MAP and the ICP. So now the MAP, as we know, is going to be between 70 to 105, and we know the ICP values are going to range between 5 and 15. CPP is going to equal MAP minus ICP, where changes in MAP or ICP can affect CPP. So the CPP values should be between 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Now, that's the pressure required for the heart to pump blood to the carotids up to your vertebral arteries to the circle of Willis. Then the blood from the circle of Willis has to go to the small arteries to the cerebral cortex. So now again, neurosurgeons prefer CPP or cerebral perfusion pressure to be at about 70. Now, normally cerebral perfusion pressure remains constant due to what's called autoregulation. And these numbers may vary from about 70 to 85 millimeters of mercury. Now for those patients with an abnormal mean arterial pressure or an abnormal intracranial pressure, the cerebral perfusion pressure is going to be calculated by subtracting the intracranial pressure from the mean arterial pressure. Now, one of the main dangers of increased ICP is that it can cause ischemia by decreasing the CPP. As ICP approaches mean arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion is going to fall. Now, the body responds to this fall in cerebral perfusion pressure by raising the blood pressure and dilating the cerebral blood vessels. This increases the cerebral blood volume, further worsening ICP and starting a vicious cycle that's going to lower that CPP even further. Now, the brain has an intrinsic ability to autoregulate. This is what's called cerebral autoregulation. This is where the blood vessels constrict and dilate in response to environmental changes. Now, this mechanism of autoregulation fails when the CPP falls below 50 or it exceeds 150 millimeters of mercury. This is what's known as decompensation. So now when the brain loses its ability to compensate or autoregulate, pressure on the cerebral vessels slows or impedes blood flow to the brain tissue. This diminished circulation is going to lead to ischemia where CO2 and lactic acid is going to start to accumulate. So then once that happens, hypoxia and hypercapnia, or elevated CO2, is going to lead to vasodilation, where this increase in blood volume produces brain edema. So now that when this happens, the ICP is going to go up, which is going to cause the cerebral vessels to compress, which causes further ischemia, and then therefore cerebral circulation is going to seize, ultimately progressing to brain death. Now, back in the day, CPP wasn't well understood. Keeping blood pressure low was thought to be the gold standard. Now, of course, today we know that a higher blood pressure is going to be preferred in this patient population in order to maintain CPP. So keeping CPP between 60 to 80 or systolic blood pressure less than 140 is what you can expect to see on the exam. But this is a very delicate balance. Of course, too much blood flow can increase ICP, which is not good, and of course, too little blood flow will reduce perfusion, which also isn't good. So when the patient sustains a brain injury with increased intracranial pressure, the idea that you're looking for is adequate blood flow. So now let's look at some of the causes of increased intracranial pressure. Now one of the primary things that's going to increase intracranial pressure is hypercapnia and hypoxia. You want to keep the PaCO2 normal, or about 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. You want to keep the PaO2 greater than 80 millimeters of mercury. If the PaO2 falls to below 60, this is going to cause arterial dilation of the cerebral arteries, which increases blood flow. This, of course, as we know now, leads to increased intracranial pressure, which in the diseased brain is going to be dangerous. Now, hypocapnia, which is PaCO2 less than 35, is going to cause arteriolar constriction of the cerebral arteries, which reduces blood flow and oxygen. 
So balancing the PaCO2 is very, very important in keeping the cerebral blood flow at that optimum state. So in understanding when you need to keep cerebral blood flow at an optimum state, one of the questions that you may see on the exam is going to pertain to endotracheal tube suctioning. You may see a question that relates to the nurse performing endotracheal tube suctioning frequently which is not gonna be the right answer. In these cases or in these patient populations, you wanna space out that ET tube suctioning because each time you do that suctioning, you're gonna increase that CO2 level in the patient, which we know now is not good for these patient populations. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is you wanna avoid giving these patients hypotonic fluids such as D5W as those types of fluids are gonna cause the cells in the brain to expand which is gonna promote cerebral edema. That's why when you see in these patient populations, some of the patients are gonna be given rather hypertonic fluids, such as mannitol or 3%. These types of fluids are gonna cause the cells in the brain to shrink and to help reduce that cerebral edema, which is gonna help promote healing in these patient populations. Another thing that increases intracranial pressure is gonna be hyperthermia. This increases the brain's metabolic rate, which increases oxygen demands, therefore increasing the cerebral blood volume. So it's very, very important to keep these patients normothermic. Another cause of increased ICP is gonna be from mass lesions or space occupying lesions such as tumors, hematomas, or hemorrhages from traumatic injuries or spontaneous bleeds. Now we're gonna discuss these types of brain injury further in just a moment. Another potential cause of increased ICP is the impairment of venous drainage through the jugular veins or that arterial blood flow through the carotid arteries. So some of the things that the nurse needs to keep in mind is you need to keep those patients with neutral neck alignment and you wanna avoid IJ central lines. Another thing to do is maybe make sure those trach ties aren't too tight and as well as those C collars, those patients with your C collars, make sure those are properly fitted. It's important to keep the head of bed elevated. You wanna avoid hip extreme flexion or a prone position or Trendelenburg. Another thing is also to avoid straining while stooling. So usually these patients with neuro injuries are prescribed a very strict bowel regimen. So again, there's many things that can cause increased intracranial pressure in these patients. So things to keep in mind again, avoid oversuctioning these patients, avoid stressful environments, even bright lights, noise, or even painful or nauseous stimuli are all gonna contribute to increased intracranial pressure in these patients. And it's very, very important as the nurse to maintain that type of environment that helps promote decreasing intracranial pressure. Okay.